so I'm just, just, just getting ready for bed. Just crawled in the bed and my room is nice and cool. My teeth are nice and clean. And so am I. And I wanted to share with you some beautiful facts. Some of the most interesting, most amazing, inspiring, awful, maybe terrifying, maybe consoling facts about the universe that we live in. It's immense, perhaps infinitely so, and we only see a small portion The part of it that light has been able to so far traverse. But I know you, just like me, are inspired and amazed. And let's just zone out and let's put aside any worries of the day tonight. Speaking of out there, every single time you look into the night sky, you are looking back in time. The nearest star to us is four, four light years away, so that's four years. Most of the universe is over two million years old for us. Two million is the age we're looking at Andromeda at. So, for all we know, one million nine hundred ninety thousand years ago, the massive black hole at the center of Andromeda could have exploded and we're merely waiting for that light to reach us. And in fact, using the miracle of science, the really a uh, atypical invention of science five, six hundred years ago. We were able to look through the Hubble telescope billions, not just millions, but billions of years into the past. And if we look far enough back, we can actually detect the cosmic microwave background. After the Big Bang, the, the universe was unimaginably hot. So hot that protons individual protons and neutrons that make up the nuclei of atoms hadn't even cooled and coalesced. So this cosmic microwave background was from when the universe still hadn't recombined all of its subatomic particles. It was actually a hot plasma, a white, dense, hot plasma. This plasma was filled with a uniform glow. 
was like a white hot fog. And as the universe expanded, both the plasma and the radiation filling it grew colder. And when the universe grew cool enough, the protons and electrons combined to form neutral hydrogen. But unlike the uncombined protons and electrons, these newly conceived atoms could not absorb the thermal radiation, and so the universe became transparent instead of an opaque fog. This is known as the time of the last scattering, and it actually appears on our old CRT television sets when it's tuned to a dead channel. Another interesting thing is Astronomers have actually discovered the largest known diamond in our galaxy. It's a massive lump of crystallized diamond called BPM 37093. They named it Lucy after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky. found 50 light years away in the constellation Centaurus. It's about 25,000 miles across. So it's actually much larger than Earth. <laughs> it weighs in at 10 billion trillion carats. We spin, electrons spin, quarks spin, the sun spins, the entire solar system itself rotates around the galaxy that is spinning, but the fastest, the absolute fastest thing in the universe that spins neutron stars, and pulsars are actually a particular type of neutron star that emits a beam of radiation which can be observed as a pulse of light as the star spins. For a long time, astronomers thought that these were actually artificial beacons, lighthouse, signposts, navigational beacons for transgalactic or interstellar aliens to organize their bearings around. But as we've begun to observe a little more in depth that we've realized that these are naturally occurring phenomena, but nonetheless, even some of our satellites orient themselves in space using these very ostentatious physical celestial phenomena. In fact, the fastest spinning of these pulsars which has in its, on its equator 
spinning at 24% of the speed of light. God, that translates to 70,000 kilometers per second. And these neutron stars, they're not just spinning fast. What's crazy is that they're so, so dense that a spoonful of neutron star weighs a billion tons. One billion tons. And speaking of dense objects, perhaps in the future we would be able to make black holes and then slowly absorb the Hawking radiation given off from it. If we were to collapse the entire mass of our Earth down to about the size of a marble, it would collapse in on itself eventually to become a black hole. One thing that's really, really cool to observe if you're lucky enough to be somewhere without light pollution is that at the Andromeda Galaxy, the closest large comparable sized galaxy to our Milky Way is actually six times larger than the moon in the night sky from our vantage point. Six times. And what are galaxies but matter formed in the local pockets of really, really, really dense gravitational fields we call stars. And when these stars explode, after they've been fusing atoms for billions of years, many times those Regurgitating those, those compellingly large explosions, they spark, they initiate the collapse of new nebulous clouds into flat rotating disks that eventually dense, condense into new stars. So out of these new stars, most of the masses, these, these uh, nebular systems, most of the mass is reformed into new stars, but some of them are formed into planets. And those planets, on those planets, biology, like ours, has formed. And because the universe initially formed the most rudimentary element, which was hydrogen and helium, both with one and two protons in their nuclei, respectively, all the other matter, carbon, oxygen, iron, phosphorus, potassium, all the larger ones, And therefore 90% of our mass is in fact stardust because all the elements except for hydrogen and helium are created in stars from being fused. I think that's fantastic. And the 10% of our body that isn't star stuff is most ancient, 14 billion year old elements that were first coalesced after the universe cooled enough to form a single and double proton atoms. And 
pretty God, it's really just majestic to imagine that there will be a time, maybe a hundred thousand billion years from now, like a hundred trillion years from now, that our universe will be so evolved and will have used up most of its material and matter in our stellar fusions. And so right now we're actually in a very special, very unique, very creative, chaotic, yet creative, point of the universe. Stars are being formed every day, and some astronomers' best estimates say that nearly 270 million stars are created every single day. Every single day. And that's why there's so many stars in our Milky Way. Our solar system itself takes about 225 million years to rotate just once around the Milky Way. In fact, the last time Earth was in its current position, dinosaurs were just beginning to roam Earth. We always try to lump a lot of the dinosaurs together because the geological time scales are so immense, so hard to fathom and differentiate 20 million from 200 million years. But in fact, the time difference between the great Tyrannosaurus Rex. Just the sheer immensity and mysteriousness of our cosmic environment, both far and near, is enough to keep us going for days. But if we turn it into ourselves, in our biology, on Earth, so many just humbling, profound facts as well, such as there are more bacteria that live and work in one linear centimeter of your lower colon than all humans who have ever, ever, ever lived on Earth. In fact, it seems like by mass we're mostly bacteria, which makes you think just how dependent we are, and uh, just how complex our biological and biochemis biochemical structures are. Some scientists have discovered, uh, or have tried to perceive what it would be like 
and how space-time would be warped from being right near a black hole. And it turns out that if you could look out from inside a black hole, you would be able to not only see the entire universe in one small patch of sky, You know, another interesting thing about our Earth is that its rotation is slowing at a rate approximately 17 milliseconds a century in the length of the day for the dinosaurs was actually closer to 22 hours. But nonetheless, it's still pretty close to our modern a fact, the funny fact about time, if we had a sufficiently powerful and precise telescope to be able to look at a mirror placed not four light years away like our nearest star, but 22 light years away, we would be able to watch the Apollo landing on the moon in real time next year. Sorry, in 2014, that would have been 44 years after the 1969 moon landing. I think that's just so, God, that's so profound. Wow. You know, given enough time, hydrogen begins to wonder where it came from and where it is going. You're orbiting a power 
you know, I think our consciousness was developed out of a sense, an urgency, a need to filter out extraneous information. And we are able to hyper-focus on the things that matter, like our social groups and taking care of our families and hunting and then perhaps using tools and the abstract concept And I think the fact that there are 170 billion galaxies in the observable universe lends some credibility to the one, one of the things we can perceive is that there may very well be much more life. Because the universe as entropic as it is, gravity is counteracting the entropy and coalescing matter, joining it together, and there's very interesting things like our brains that have evolved and they've evolved to such an extent that they're able to think about how they've evolved and in fact the human brain is the most complex object in the known universe with hundreds is pretty useful. Now this whole time, as far as I know, I'm gonna edit this so that you've been 
looking at the Voyager spacecraft record in the Voyager spacecraft well there's actually two and NASA engineers actually considered more than 10,000 possible trajectories for these spacecraft because this is our first attempt to reach out engineers decided to do as many things simultaneously with this profound mission which extended our culture to the stars, extended our culture all the way out into the galaxy in our first attempt. The engineers needed to chart a precise course that would take the Voyager close to the planets, but not so close that the next leg of the journey was compromised. And actually, Voyager 1 was able to fly close enough to, to uh, Saturn. still be propelled towards interstellar space. Now, in order to offer a sense of Earth's culture to any spacefarers, we at NASA included a 12-inch gold-plated audio-visual disc on the craft. Sagan's spouse recalled that telling humanity's story was a sacred undertaking. She and Carl Sagan in their group of, as she calls them, half a dozen very flawed human beings had taken it upon themselves to represent humanity as a culture and as a an aesthetic to explain to anything that might be out there who and what we're all about. They arrived at the idea during a meeting of the American Astronomical Society in January of 1977. The Voyager probes would launch in late August, so representing the entirety of human achievement in a single recording would have had to be done quickly. So the group, as humans have want to do, or want to do, divided the labor. John Lomberg was in charge of assembling pictures of her. Timothy Ferris selected the music 
Martin Andrew and the project's creative director, and later the co-writer, writer of uh, Cosmos, of course, oversaw the records, Sounds of Earth. Linda Salzman collected greetings from people around the world, and Sagan himself served as the liaison between them and NASA. The team set about researching, talking to historians and artists and ethnomusicologists. They reached out to political groups, documentarians. They recorded human speaking, and among them, in perhaps the record's most iconic track, Sagan's young son, saying, Greetings from the children of planet Earth. The result was a time capsule that was, and still is somewhere out there in space, much more suggestive than summative. Humanity's cosmic mixtape. It's blasted from Earth in 1977 with the Voyager spacecraft. The record shares the tweetings of birds, the calls of humpback whales, and the hootings of chimpanzees. Chimpanzees. It includes salesman work, salesman's work spoken. It includes salesman's work, spoken greetings of earthlings rendered in 55 languages, starting with the Akkadian spoken in Sumer about 6,000 years ago, and culminating with Wu, a modern Chinese dialect. And there's 90 minutes of music, including classical tunes from cultures around the globe. And this includes the first two bars of Beethoven's string quartet, which sounds like this. First two bars of Beethoven's string quartet number 13 in B flat. So the golden record is encased in a protective aluminum jacket along with a cartridge and a needle. And both include symbolic instructions explaining the origin of the spacecraft and indicate how the record should be played. And ideally, the record is played at 16 and two-thirds revolutions per minute. The logic of all this is simple. It will be ten, tens of thousands of years, if ever, before either Voyager can make a close approach to any planetary system that lies beyond our own. The spacecraft, as Carl Sagan puts it, will be encountered in the record player only if there are advanced spacefaring civilizations in interstellar space. So on the round circle, you can see it's, it's actually binary code to finding the proper speed. 3.6 seconds per rotation to turn the record. Each each um, radial line stands for a one each circumferential line or horizontal looking line 
stands for a zero. Speaking of pulsars, as we did earlier, they actually used 14 different pulsars of known directions to triangulate, or whatever the word for 14 directions of uh, alignment would be, our sun from them. The binary code actually defines the frequency. more like a heartbeat diagram, whatever, the cardiac graph, is the general appearance of waveform of video signals found on the recording. The binary code tells of the time scan about 8 milliseconds, and the triangular sawtooth waveform is the scan triggering. In the video image in the top rectangle with a little bit of lines at the left and a smaller amount at the right is the video image frame showing direction of scan in binary code indicates time of each scan sweep 512 vertical lines per complete picture and if properly decoded the first image will appear as a circle. And then lastly, the little barbell at the bottom, two circles connected by a line, is the diagram that illustrates the two lowest states of the hydrogen atom. The vertical lines with the dots indicates the spin moments of the proton and electron. Transition time from one state to the other provides the fundamental clock reference used in all the cover diagrams and decoded pictures. So that's just really very cool, very simple, pretty quite brilliant actually. That they knew they could stick with a constant something that's a constant across the entire universe, or at least that we have observed, would be a constant in our galaxy. The, the fundamental time it takes for the hydrogen atom to transition from one electron configuration to the next most the next least energetic state. So the golden record carries more than English words. They carry our culture. And they carry the transcendent aspects of human existence. And 
to anyone who might call the same space home. Jimmy's, Jimmy Carter's soundbite put it nicely. This is a present from a small distant world, a token of our sounds, our science, our images, our music. Wow, it's beautiful to speak, literally speak to the future. And I'm going to leave it there. I don't think I could do any better than that. And I hope you guys are feeling nice and relaxed. I hope this really centered your sense of being and sense of self and sense of place and time and space. We are in a fast, mysterious cosmos, but we have each other and we have our history and there's so much of it to explore and so many shelves of books to read through. As Nietzsche put it, the human life is packed with so much to explore that even hundreds of years still wouldn't yield to think, discover, explore, condense and synthesize information into what we already know. The act of exploration, the act of sharing the exploits and the treasure from what we have explored.